Okay, so this is uh, a deep dive into book 17 to 20. So my pattern has been every time uh, we read four chapters together, uh, we have an overview of each chapter, uh, an audio book and a, a reading of each chapter. And every four chapters we stop. And I think uh, if you're a teacher listening to this, I think it's really important just to catch your breath and to just sort of pause the reading. And also it's a chance to stop and take note of what students have paid close attention to. So uh, here are some, some thoughts about chapter 17 to 20, which is a continuance of Odysseus's second set of, uh, well, third set of battles, right? His, his literal battle in the Trojan War, followed by his battle against witches and monsters, followed by his battle to return to some sort of semblance of normalcy at home. So I entitled this talk, Truths and Disguises. So here are the seven things I'm gonna ask. And, uh, and, and by no means do I finish discussing any of them. This is just the beginnings of conversations that certainly can be grown in a million directions. One, why does Odysseus's origin story matter? Two, what are Odysseus's problems right now? Three, how does Odysseus deal with his problems? Four, uh, it's an interesting conversation to have with students. Can a hero also be a liar? Five, what other choices could Homer have made after Odysseus's return home? Six, what about people not named Odysseus? Seven, what can we learn from Argos the dog? So first, we have Odysseus's origin story. And uh it's it's the story that's told uh, in book 19, line 390. And we learn of this famous hunting expedition. But before that, we learn that Odysseus's grandfather, Otilicus, right around book 19 in the Emily Wilson translation on page 437, line 397 or so says until Antilochus was the best of all mankind at telling lies and stealing two things that odysseus has been doing for years now so one wonders uh are his criminal tendencies a result of just surviving warfare and just developing those habits are they in part genetic from his grandfather he goes on to say around line 405 Name your grandson this much wanted baby boy. Name him this. I'm disliked by many all across the world, and I dislike them back. This is the grandfather of Odysseus talking. So name the child Odysseus. They end up going on a on a hunting expedition, and Odysseus gets injured by a boar. But the name Odysseus is really interesting. Um and, and we'll discuss it. Uh, in this this book I recently read, An Odyssey, A Father, Son, and an Epic, is by scholar Daniel Mendelssohn, who teaches at Bard College. And it's uh, I'll talk about this book in another presentation, but it's, it's completely worth reading on every level. So here, I just want to read a paragraph from the book. Uh, the scar, we remember, is the telltale sign. This The scar is the scar the boar gives Odysseus as part of his identity, right? The scar we remember is a telltale sign that identifies Odysseus to Eurylica, 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 and it's his nurse. And its history deeply entwines the poem's themes of pain and identity. The hero's strange name, and again, Odysseus literally means the man of pain. And it's given to him at birth by his grandfather, who caused so many people so much pain. And it's while visiting the same grandfather that Odysseus goes on the boar hunt during which he receives the wound that will become the scar, which is to say both of the things that identify Odysseus, the markers of who he is, his name and the scar, are both connected to pain. So that's an observation. It's not a complete interpretation of the poem of the character. So that's just a starting point that might be interesting to mention in a discussion about uh, the section of the poem. So what are Odysseus's problems right now his problems do evolve his problems do change according to where he is 
So first is that he's alone. He left with something like six or 700 of the best and brightest men of Ithaca 20 years ago. And he made it home as the only member of that group of men to have survived. And in Dr. Uh, Jonathan Shea's book, Achilles in America, he makes this statement uh, when discussing veterans returning home. He says, many veterans experience that disorienting bewilderment. And when they look at their home, they think this wasn't the place they left. You know, I, I talk to my students if they've ever moved homes and years later they visit their old home and they notice the basketball hoop is gone, the paint job is different, the yard's different. Without the trauma of warfare, it's still weird seeing your home occupied by other people sort of organized differently. Well, this is obviously a very different thing. So aside from the cosmetics and aside from the suitors and aside from his family changing and aside from everything changing, he's also alone. And I would say one of the most important things I'd like you to take note of is he is the only man on his island who understands what he's been through. The current generation of Ithacan men have not fought in war. Odysseus has killed the previous generation of Ithacan men, or they've all died on his watch. The younger generation of Ithacan men are hitting on his wife. They haven't fought in war. He is all alone in every important way. And I think that's just important to, to take note of when you're imagining him on this island right now. Secondly, and I, I alluded to this before, but I thought it'd be interesting for you to see it. Odysseus's name means man of pain. And it's, it's connected to the Greek verb odusemai, which is to be, to hate, to feel wrath against, or odurumai, to lament or bewail, or even ulumai, which is to be lost. So all of those things sort of remind us his very name is connected to who he is and what he goes through. So that's kind of interesting. And then he is a light year away from regaining his marital life with Penelope safely, regaining his father, fatherly existence, regaining his leadership of an island that hasn't seen him in two decades. He has 108 suitors ready to kill him on the spot if he shows up. He has a son who probably doesn't exactly know what to make of him. He has a wife who probably thinks he's dead. So, you know, when you're only ally really might be maybe your teenage son who has no fighting experience and a guy who takes care of pigs. He is a long way away from regaining anything like the life he left before the Trojan War. Third, how does Odysseus deal with his problems? He has as serious a set of problems probably as any character in Western literature. So how does he go about dealing with them? It's pretty interesting. Right when he lands, uh, right when he lands on Ithaca, this is really after the assist given by Athena. And I don't mention that here. Maybe I should. But the first thing he does is he looks for safety. And how strange is that? It's not. This is what he does in every strange place, every island, every remote corner of the world he finds himself throughout his journey. Interestingly, when he returns to the place that's technically his home, he still defaults to the same instinct. Where do I find safety? And he finds it with the guy who takes care of pigs because really quickly he realizes that Eumaeus is a good Greek, a good Ithacan, super faithful, has nothing, but even though he has next to nothing, he gives everything he has to this guest. And interestingly, Odysseus, I, I think of that to me, the most revolutionary moment in all of Homer, maybe, definitely in the Odyssey, I feel is Odysseus's conversation with Achilles in Book 11, in which he worships this hero of the Trojan War, his, his comrade in arms, only to be told that Achilles, the spirit, says, I would rather be the, the sort of hired man of a, of a slave on earth than be the leader of all, the hero, the king of all the dead. You know, And strangely, where does Odysseus find himself in the middle of this entire poem? As someone who is beholden to a slave, kind of like what Achilles says he dreams of in Hades. So I, I just found that interesting. I don't know what to make of that, but I found it interesting. 
So here's a here's a here's a word. Another way he copes with his problems is uh, an attempt at reconnection, pretty cautiously with his wife. And when he's at the island of the Phaeacians in book six, he says this really interesting thing. It's on the top of page two or three of the Emily Wilson. He says, so may the gods grant all your heart's desires, a home and a husband, someone like minded. He says this to Nausicaa, who very well could be his wife, right? The young girl who did her laundry. Somebody like minded. For, and here's the line. This is so important. For nothing could be better. Then when two live in one house, their minds in harmony, husband and wife, their enemies are jealous, their friends delighted, and they have great honor. Really, really interesting. So the word in Greek for that, if you want to impress your friends or an incredibly old Greek person, maybe in your town, is homophrosine, which simply means like-minded, being of one mind, being really on the same page, if you want to put a, a modern phrase to it. And... In, in book 18, uh, we learn that, you know, Penelope, who doesn't know, she she's talking to Odysseus. She thinks she's being hospitable to a beggar. She says, she, she kind of walks through what she's done with the suitors and the trickery with the weaving and all that. And it says on line 282, Odysseus, who had endured, this is page 418. Odysseus, who had endured so much, was happy she was secretly procuring presents and charming them with words while her mind moved elsewhere. So in other words, Odysseus finds a homophrosine, a like-mindedness, a being on the same pageness with his wife. When? When she's tricking people, when she's lying, when she's manipulating, when she's using metis, cleverness, cunning. So, so he's trying to cope first safety, right? Secondly, sort of maybe a sense of reconnection. Third, and incredibly impressive on one level, and I would argue scary on another. And Shay in uh, Odysseus in America is brilliant on this, both in his discussion of Vietnam veterans and his reading of the Odyssey. Unbelievable, really. Totally worth buying the book just for this discussion. And it's that Odysseus has his mission first and foremost in his mind, right? So think of the fact that he has seen his wife for the first time in 20 years, his son for the first time as a grown up, his homeland. Think of, think of people that should be beholden to him throwing stools at his face. He maintains his self control throughout because he needs a plan in order to overwhelm the suitors and, and reign in Ithaca again. And until that plan is concretized and ready to go, he's going to maintain self-control and keep his emotions in check. Um, Wilfred Owen, who's a brilliant World War I poet, said this, dullness, like a lack of feeling, right? Dullness best solves the tease and doubt of shelling. So in World War I, when you get your line would get pummeled with the shells of the Germans. He says that the best way to solve that is dullness. Just have a stone face, have no feelings, just control yourself and keep it all inside. It's exactly what Odysseus does. Okay. So one of the things that we could discuss throughout this entire epic is can a hero be a liar? And a sub question of this that's worth and as an essay topic, frankly, is, is Odysseus a good man, right? Uh, and, and perhaps connected to that is the idea that if you've spent almost all of your adult life doing everything you can to survive every day of your adult life, um, you really grow accustomed to disguises, to duplicity, to lying, to using weapons that aren't weapons, to breaking rules, to do anything you can to survive. And that just becomes your habit. But this is worth talking about. If you're reading this in a reading group or in a class, this is just a really simple question that everybody can understand, but it points to the essence, in my view, of Odysseus's complexity as a literary character, that there's a, there's a really good chance that in him is both heroism and evil to a large extent. And that's, maybe worth wrestling with.
five. Um, this is sort of interesting. I, when I teach classics to my students, I never want them to think that the classics descended as is from heaven, right? Whether it's Homer or Shakespeare or Dickens or or uh, or, or or Twain or or a modern writer, uh, Colson Whitehead or Toni Morrison or whomever, whoever it is. These people looked at blank pages and well, Homer didn't look at a blank page because he was blind and there were no pages. But aside from that, um, these people had choices that they made and we have the end result of them, but they could have been otherwise. So rather than Odysseus landing in Ithaca in book 13 and taking 12 chapters for the book, for the epic to resolve, what, what else could have happened? So here's just a couple of options. Why wouldn't Athena after telling Odysseus about the suitors, telling Odysseus, you have to find a way to kill 108 of them. Why doesn't Odysseus tell her, I'm done, right? I have spent almost 20 years of my life with bodies all around me, whether they're bodies in the Trojan War or whether they're bodies of my own men being eaten by the Cyclops and Scylla and the last Dragonians getting, you know, throwing rocks at us. Why wouldn't he say, I'm done? And I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the answer that I have heard some people give, which is because then it wouldn't be an epic poem because we have all these chapters left. That's not a legitimate answer. It has to work within the story. And this is an option. So I guess the sub question is, is Odysseus sick of bloodshed? I get the sense if he was sick of bloodshed, he would say so. So that might be an interesting question. So interesting question one is, why doesn't Odysseus tell Athena he's sick of fighting? He's done, figure it out. And underneath that, do you think Odysseus is actually sick of fighting? Worth, worth wondering about. Another option is, why not kill Antinous, who was definitely the most vocal leader among the suitors? And then, presuming the other suitors freak out, maybe demand payment from them, keep them alive. Why go on this bloodthirsty rampage? I mean, I don't have a set answer for this. Maybe this is worth discussing. How would the book change, right? If we were ready to resolve the book really quickly. Okay, the next question. It's really, really important when you're reading books like The Odyssey and I would say Hamlet, books that seem to center so much on one character so much so that the books themselves are named after that character. So I would just say, I would pay really, really close attention to the fact that something Homer, I think and is the first person in Western literature to acknowledge is that the families left home when the man of the house serves in war that the families left home also serve in their own way. That what we saw in books one to four and what we've, what we've seen since book 13 when we've returned to Ithaca is a very scary kind of brokenness in Ithaca that Telemachus and Penelope, mainly Penelope, is just trying to hold together. They have very little hope Odysseus will come back. I know Telemachus knows about Odysseus now, but for a long time had no hope. And pay really close attention, not only to Odysseus's problems, but Telemachus and Penelope's problems. Um, if this was a one person story, it wouldn't work. There's a whole network of relationships that are life and death that matter very much. And then seventh, and I, I love thinking about this. I think there's uh you know, entire, entire papers to be written about Argos the dog. So Odysseus shows up and he's with Eumaeus and uh, we're on line 290 in book 17. And it's just, it's an incredibly sad moving passage. We know that Argos was a puppy. We know that in line 296, it says, Now he lay, Argos lay neglected without an owner in a pile of dung or poop from mules and cows. He's covered in fleas. And that's a reminder, not only that, you know, be nice to your animals, please. Don't put them in poop and cover them with fleas. But 
It says Argos in 300, Argos lay there dirty, covered with fleas, and in the most decrepit, awful state imaginable. Laying on poop, covered in fleas. The next line. And when Argos realized Odysseus was near, he wagged his tail and both ears dropped back. He, he was too weak to move towards his master. And then Odysseus noticed this. And on the next page, line 325, 20 years had passed since Argos saw Odysseus. And now he saw him for the final time. Suddenly, black death took hold of him. And I think there's a few things lurking here that are really, really interesting. Um, a if you don't have sympathy, if you don't have feelings during this chapter, I, I really can't help you beyond that. You have, you have issues, but um, what does it say that Argos is the first Ithacan to recognize Odysseus on his own? I think Argos on the surface level represents the fact that Ithaca is falling apart without Odysseus in charge, right? Uh, you don't take care of your animal like this. What does that say about you? But aside from that, um, Od Argos recognizes, even though Odysseus is in the disguise of a beggar, Argos instinctively recognizes his master and almost outs him, right? Odysseus can't be discovered. And Argos dies uh, really tragically. And, and I wouldn't say suddenly because he's a 20-year-old dog. Um, but in a way, it, it begs an interesting question. Um, are characters more authentically themselves when they think through something and then act or when they just act instinctively? Argos just senses his master and reacts. And there's this really authentic sense to that moment. Um, but ask yourself, why do you think there's so many things Homer could talk about, right? Odysseus is home for the first time. You get, you know, more Telemachus stuff you could do. You get Antinous stuff. You can do that sooner. There's infinite things. Why mention a dog? Why do this? Right? Why do this? So that's worth talking about. And I think in a in a, any conversation with a group of people, particularly some animal lovers, you might get some interesting responses. Um, I hope this uh, this uh, very quick deep dive into si chapter sixteen through twenty are helpful. Uh, again, I'm I'm really just scratching the surface on a few issues I think are important, but I hope this is helpful for you. And and good luck with your continued reading.